upon your life is beginning to shatter as you lift up your praise, as you lift up your sound. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Sing Deborah. Sing Deborah. Sing Deborah. Sing Deborah. Sing Deborah. Angels are being released and hastening to the word of God. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, you begin to lift it up. We're about to enter into praise and worship. But there's a shifting in the atmosphere. And there's a divine release over your life as you praise him this weekend. And I believe that the Lord is going to give you rest from your enemies. So come on, you just begin to stir it up, stir it up, stir up your praise. Come on, begin to stir up your most holy faith. Come on, begin to position your heart if you're online and you're where you can release a sound of praise. Come on, let glory begin to saturate the atmosphere. I don't know about you, but I didn't come to have my flesh satisfied. I came to touch heaven. came to be renewed and transformed. Woo! Come on, lift your hands all over this place. Father, we thank you. And we release the authority of Christ right now in this atmosphere. And we decree that breakthrough is here, that we are at the threshold of greater and we come against every hindrance that would try to exalt itself even in this atmosphere tonight. And we decree, King Jesus, come on, you say it. We decree, we decree, we decree, King Jesus, ride on your glory. King Jesus, ride on your glory. We decree. Ride on your glory, King Jesus. Ride every wave of your glory. Come on, begin to give a shout of praise. Come on, break through, break through, break through, break through. Woo! Hallelujah. Come on, shout out to God. Come on, come on, don't stop. Shout out to God. Glory fill this place. Great and mighty God. Come on. Great and mighty God. Shout on the God. Shout on the God. Hallelujah. Come on, just a few more seconds. Hallelujah. God, we thank you for your glory, Lord. Thank you, Holy Ghost. This brother, praise God. Hallelujah. Everybody clap, 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 clap. Oh, God. Here we go. Ah. Come back and let's worship our King. Come let us bow.
our faith right now. And even as the worship team began to sing in the name of Jesus, we don't want to just sit here and think about fictitious enemies. Come on, I got some real enemies I need the Lord of hosts to be on the move for. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so can we put those things in the atmosphere as we decree in the name of Jesus, right? We're shouting it out that we're victorious, but come on, I want you to activate your faith about whatever that is over your marriage, over your finances, over your relationships, whatever that thing is, it's got a name. But the Bible decrees that every name is subject to what name? The name that is above every name. The name that causes hell to tremble and be dismantled. Come on. So when we decree in the name of Jesus, it doesn't mean that hell has to stop. It means that hell has to lose whatever it was trying to take. Come on, the Bible decrees that if a thief is caught, he must return seven times. So are there any contenders in here? Come on, we're just gonna go in for a minute. Is that okay? Over cancer, over diabetes, over dementia, over unforgiveness, over generational bur uh, burdens, over depression. What, come on, you put a name on it. Cause we're about to decree that in the name of Jesus, on, on, on not only are we victorious, but we're coming up and coming out of those things this weekend. Come on, just begin to stir yourself up. You just begin to stir up your faith right now. Come on, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Ha! 
want to put somebody on the spot. Can I put you on the spot, Miss Pam? Will you come and tell them what happened when you began to praise them? Somebody say about a week ago. Praise the Lord. The Sunday before Mother's Day, um, I was down front and we were praising the Lord. And they, I think it was the Sunday before that, somebody prayed for me. And I told the young lady that I had a growth behind my ear and it was sticking out. They didn't know what it was. I'd been for a CT scan. And the Sunday after that, when we began to praise the Lord, they were singing that song about Onaga. And I was down front just just having a good time, just dancing. And when they begin to speak about healing, I begin to thank God for it. And as I begin to feel behind my ear, the knock was gone. It was gone. <laughs> and I just praise God. I just thank you so I'm so grateful. So I'm saying that to build your faith because we're not in an aerobics class right now. Come on. There are some real things that are happening in our lives and we're about to decree in the name of Jesus. Come on, are there two, three praisers in this place that are stirred up here in Sister Pam's story? Her growth dissolved in the presence of the Lord. Nobody had to lay hands on her. <laughs> so come on, come on. We're about to decree that in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.
Press into that for a minute. I'm Press into that for a minute. But I'm surrounded by you. I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. like I'm being impressed just very slightly that some of you still think that praise and worship is, is really not the, uh, the, the Hopeites that have been here a long time. It's really, some of you really think that praise and worship is not warfare. It's, it's not serious. It's just timidity. It's, it's just something that we do because we're traditionally like to do it in church. But you don't realize that praise really is your weapon. So some of you who are in a hard spot, in a hard place, need to use the weapon, your tool of praise and worship to break you out of it. It is a tool. It is an assistant. It will help. It will help move you, shape you, push you out of depression. So I need you to be very intentional. And again, this is not so much for the old Hopites who have been here a long time. It's more so for others who just think that we just do this just to do it and because it's nice to do it. And it's nice to see the shots of, of looking at different churches with people with the fog in the background and people on their knees and all that kind of stuff. It has absolutely nothing to do with what's really happening that we are trying to get you to connect with God in a corporate environment so God can move in a corporate way yet individual way. Let me say that again. It's to get you to connect with God so God can move in a corporate environment in a corporate way. That means he's moving amongst us all, but yet it's in an individual way. 
So let's lift our voices real quick as we transition. Father, we thank you for this time of praise and worship. As we connect to you, Lord, we will remember from this day forward that it is the time for us to minister to you. We are always asking for you to minister to us. But Lord, we lift you up and we magnify you and we thank you that you are our heavenly Father. You are our good, good Father. You will never leave us nor forsake us. You are always with us to take us through the things that have bound us up, that have cemented us in place. I thank you, Father, for the moving and the brooding of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Lord, for times like this where we can be reminded that we are surrounded by you. So we talk you up. We praise you up. We pray you up. Lord, we lift our hands before you. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are always ever with us in Jesus, Jesus' mighty name. Let's give God a round of applause. Another one, another one. We bless you, Father. Well, hello, women, and welcome to the 2023 Women's Conference. Yeah. Where the theme is, train my hands to war. Train my hands to war. Uh, I believe it's the King James Version that says, train my hands to war and my fingers to fight. I like that one. I like that one. I like that one a lot. All right, so praise God. Don't forget the theme is train my hands to war. And that is scriptural. That is based off of Psalms 144, verse 1, that says, Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trained my hands for war and my fingers for battle. So, of course, you'll be explained in different aspects what those things mean all throughout this weekend. So this is a time especially curated, especially prepared for you women. All right, so we are believing for an outpouring of the glory of God, healing, miracles, uh, practical godly wisdom to be imparted to you women so you can win in every area of your life. All right, so we have a great lineup of ministers to minister to you. And of course, tonight we have our very own apostle, Michelle Jackson. Praise God for that. Yeah. The juggernauts of the Lord. All right, tomorrow, Friday night, May 19th, we will hear from Pastor Kim Owens. All right. Pastor Kim Owens is Apostle Jackson's favorite fire brand. That means she's a fiery preacher. And of course, Saturday, she's no stranger to this house. On May 20th, you'll be hearing from Apostle Sharon Nesbitt. All right? Yeah. And also several other ministers in the breakout sessions that you have access to. And let's not forget about Sunday, so I'll put it out there. Don't forget, Sharon Nisbet will be with us on Sunday as well, so make sure you're a part of it. Don't forget, we have intercession from 9 o'clock a.m. to 10 o'clock a.m. Worship and the Word starts at 10 o'clock a.m. on forward. So please make sure you prepare yourself for that. All right, before we continue on with tonight's festivities, I want to make sure you know and give you a reminder about tomorrow's Connect Time tomorrow's connect time. Many of you may have come to the service a little late and you didn't realize that there were hors d'oeuvres out there for you. You know, the sweet teas and water and, and, and sausages and meatballs and, and uh, kale. I don't know if it's pot stickers or pot liquors. I don't know what it is. It's a uh, uh, whatever it is, you know, I didn't get anything else. You know, chicken skewers. Well, the, well, the menu is going to be different tomorrow, but it's the time for you to connect. So that means you need to be here a little bit before 7 uh, p.m. tomorrow so you can connect with other women of God, all right? Women that you know and don't know, so connect. Church is not just about you coming in the door, receiving the word, uh, hearing stuff, and then getting out. Connect with each other. Create a body of believers, a grouping of people, all right? One of the main things about church is connection. That is biblical. You can go to the Antioch church in the book of Acts that talked about how people shared all things in common and were doing house churches, of which still goes on today, by the way. So just be mindful of that. All right. So at this time, I'll welcome Lisa Garner to come up to talk about our gift giveaway portion of our service. Yes, we are giving away some gifts. Should I judge which one I like best? No. Already know. Hello, women of God. Y'all probably wondering why she walking up there like that. Well, you know what? God is always speaking. Amen. I heard some wisdom being talked about. I heard your voice needing to be used. I heard fighting your battle through praise and worship. So I know we all were praying before we got here and said, God, speak to me. I want to encounter you. I want to hear a rhema word from you for me. So I say that because as I did that, God gave me 
something that I don't believe it was just for me. He said, get dressed. Get dressed. Train my hands to war. We're about to fight a battle. But you got to be dressed for the occasion. Sometimes he might need you to just strut in your, and just gracefully walk through it because he got you. But sometimes you got to put your combat boots on. You got to put your war pants on. You see, I got a nylon over here, but this war shoe, this combat shoe, can cover all of that up for what I got to fight. So God says, get dressed because he's about to call your name. So this is giveaway. How convenient did he connect that for what the assignment was for me to do? I'm like, God, what you doing? They didn't tell me to do that. But I give it to you because I don't believe he was giving that just to me. So this weekend, some of us, you know, I said, I'm going to be walking kind of crazy. But some of us came in here limp in the natural and in the spirit. But God got what you need if you come dressed appropriately. So with that, I'm going to get to what the assignment really was. I'm sorry. Um, so we're going to do some giveaways. And we're going to do uh, four of them, two for those in the building tonight, and two for those that are joining us virtually. So the first one, and you can see, so virtual winners, your tag in your bag has a V on it, so if you are going to come into the building at some point to pick up your gift. Remember the number I tell you that's on your bag. This is in person. This is online. So I'm going to pick one from each one. Everybody got their ticket out? You have to be present to win if you're in the building. So I hope nobody's in the bathroom. <laughs> All right. In person number is 557 868. 557 868. Come on down. <laughs> the price is right, right? <laughs> there you go, ma'am. Enjoy. Oh, let me let me check this. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, yeah, we in the house, but you know, we have our own versions of the truth sometimes. Wait a minute. Okay, 868, you're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Amen. So we're going to move on to our online. Okay. Miss Deborah DeWitt. Deborah DeWitt, you are our first online winner, and the number on the bag that you won is number two. So when you come pick it up, it's bag number two. I'm going to stick your name in there also. <laughs> okay. Three and four. Number three is for in the building. Everybody got their tickets ready? All right, ladies. If you dress right today, you will be able to run down here and pick up this bag. 575-814. 5757 557 Hey! That's, that's kind of cute in there right there. You're going to like that, baby girl. That's kind of cute. Thank you. All right, and the last one for tonight will be on line winner, and she is. Shirley Jones. Shirley Jones. Your bag number is four. Make sure I'm looking at that right. 
Yep, four, and it has a V on it for virtual. So whenever you're in the building, your gift is waiting. Thank you, ladies. Enjoy what God has for you tonight. Hey, Pastor Carl. Pastor Carl, can you help her down the stairs, please? Just nice and gentle. Just nice and gentle. Just nice and slow. Just nice and slow. Just nice and gentle. Just take it easy. Just it's a live service going on here, but just take it easy. All right. Well, praise God for that. It's fun stuff, right? Everybody likes free stuff. All right. Now, if I can ask everybody to stand, please, I would appreciate that. Yes, stand, 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 stand. And we're going to do something, Hope Bites, that we haven't really done uh, in a long time. Remember, we used to do this in the chapel. We're actually going to have to take one solid minute to greet our neighbors around us. So front, back, side to side, if there's new people in here, which we'll get to in a second, I want you to meet somebody new, greet somebody, hug somebody, say hello to somebody. Come on, reach out. You got a minute, use the full minutes. Use the full minutes. Find out somebody who's sitting by themselves, looks like that doesn't want to be talked to. Meet somebody, greet somebody in Jesus' name. Keep going, keep going, keep going. You got 30 more seconds. Come on now. Keep going. We're not rushing this part. Come on. Meet somebody. That's right. Meet and greet. Walk across the aisle a little bit. See what's up. Say hello. Give a high five, a hug. Swap names. Say hello. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. All right. Now, as you begin to make your way back to your seat, see, this is what connect time is all about. That's why tomorrow you got to be here a little bit before 7 p.m. to connect. Now, as you work your way back to your seats, as you work your way back to your seats, work your way back to your seats. I love it. All the smiles, all the hugging. I love that. All right. You need to clear this middle aisle. This middle aisle, y'all need to sit down. I'm talking to you, Marla, bringing your whole family up in the group. Sit down. I love that. I love it. Part of what church is all about. Part of it. Part of it is the fellowship. All right, so as I walk off, please make sure you pay attention to the screens for what's happening at Hope and the Women's Conference announcements. Hello, Hope. Here are your weekly announcements. Have you ever wondered if God desires to speak to you? Receive the answers for this and more at Prophetic Training Part 3, Ministering by Faith, on June the 2nd and 3rd. Instruction materials and lunch are $37. Sign up to save your spot today. Send in place students, please register with your special link. Men, come out and join us for our King's Men Fellowship on Saturday, June the 10th at 10 a.m. Bring a friend. Are you ready to go higher? Surge 2023 service returns Sunday, July 30th at 6 p.m with special guest speaker, Apostle Sharon Parks. Ladies, join us for Coffee and Friends on Saturday, June the 17th for Father-Daughter Time and Bishop J. Allen Neal and our own Apostle Michelle. Fellowship begins at 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. The stream will begin. We invite you to join us in person and online. Then as we honor fathers on June 18th, Bishop J. Allen Neal will stay with us for our 10 a.m. service. We encourage you to not only invite and bring your fathers and father figures to service, but use this as an evangelistic opportunity to reach the people in your sphere of influence. River Conference 2024 registration is open. If you register before September 1st, 2023, you will receive a Release the River t-shirt as a gift while supplies last. Registration is $50. And as a special limited offer, 
release the river t-shirts will be available during the women's conference at the bookstore for $25. Get all your HCC info directly by downloading our church app. Just search Hope Christian Church MD. For all the events here at Hope, register at the church website, thehopeconnection.org. Praise God. I wish Lloyd was, uh, Lloyd was here. He looked pretty sharp in that suit. All right. Before we go on to our time of generosity, I would like to specifically acknowledge if you're here for the first time uh, in the building, those who ra- wave your hand at me, we just want to acknowledge you. We're not going to embarrass you. Anybody, anybody in particular? Anybody, anybody? I want to make sure I don't pass anybody up. Hey, welcome one. Welcome all. All right. Welcome, welcome. All right. All right. Welcome, welcome. And if you're, in the ch- if you're online, please put in the chat that it's your first time watching our service as well. And we would like to give you a quick shout out in the chat. So please be mindful of that. Now is the time for a time of generosity. It is time to give. Yeah. At Hope Christian Church, as I like to say, uh, you know, giving is one of our core values. It's something that we do all the time. It's what we're about. It's not just in finances. For those who always like to pigeonhole the church about finances, it's about you. It's about your time. It's about the infrastructure here, the volunteers that have worked the cameras and do all the things that we have here at Hope Christian Church. And as usual, during this time, we uh, typically give a testimony about what God's been doing. So I will give a testimony, but we're tweaking it as of sorts because I'm typically the guy that reminds you of all the things that we are doing here as a corporate body. Just this year so far, not only have we received, uh, or should I say, given a grocery giveaway, which many of you were a part of, we financially enabled and enable, past and current, we financially enable several ministries to accomplish their God-given calling, all right, by supporting them financially. We do that as a corporate body, all right? And not only do we have LifeNet small groups, which we, are, we are, which we love and which many of us are a part of, and if you're not a part of a LifeNet small group, you should be, all right? We also have launched Hope Healing House. How many have heard of Hope Healing House? You all should have heard it by now, our Hope Healing House, all right? So Hope Healing House is a way to minister to people's deeper spiritual and emotional needs, all right? It's a, we take people through a training course and a training curriculum, get them uh, trained, and, and then release them underneath Apostle Jackson's guidance to go ahead and make sure they minister to people. So it has been my job to try to get mostly men in our sessions, and there's been well over 50 women that have been ministered to about deep things, about deep things, about trauma and rejection and abandonment and fears and all different things of that like. It's the guys who are typically the ones lagging. So come on, men. Come on, one. Come on, all. And many of you women know that you should be in these, but you have been stiff arming as well. So we encourage you to go ahead and sign up so you can get a better life in God and realize that there are some things that are really holding you back. So why am I bringing this up in the context of the offering? Well, this because Hope Christian Church sets up that infrastructure so people's lives can be ministered too. All right. So we take it very serious and the training is serious. And I've gone through the training myself. Pastor Carl has gone through it. Pastor Thelma Hayes over here has gone through it as well. Several of our leaders have gone through it uh, as well. So we want you to not only do we need trainers or should I say not only do we need people trained to to administer it, we want you to come and sign up because many people are suffering in silence and you're still dealing with things that you've had since you were a child. Yeah. Yeah, still dealing with things that you had since you were a child, with rejection, abandonment, fears, and anxiety of all kinds. And God is here to minister to you through this program and through this Hope Healing House. So please make sure you are mindful of that. All right? So people have been healed from emotional pain of all various types. And again, as I said, the infrastructure that we have here at Hope Christian Church is about impacting people. I've said this before. I'll say it again. Many of you know at Hope Christian Church we have an anointing to mature you. We have an anointing to mature you. That's what we do. We mature people. You want to get matured? Follow the instructions. You will get matured if you follow the process. So we are able to do those things, not only the, the grocery giveaway, and we'll be doing other things later in the year, I'm sure. But again, we are having an impact in other people's lives and other people's ministries because this house is financially and prayerfully supporting them. Yes. All right. So that is a blessing. So as I always like to tie what we do and what we give to Matthew 6, 19 through 21. 
that says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, that where your heart be also. And as I like to say, that the reason why you were able to store up treasures in heaven is what we do here on the earth by impacting people's lives. Because thankfully, by what we do for those who tithe and those who give faithfully to the ministry, we are impacting other people. People have eaten because of you in this country and out of this country. People have been brought to safety in, uh, in, in another country by what we've done here. Yes. So just be mindful of that, that your finances are going great places. All right. So after I pray, then you'll be able to come up and give into the offering. And those of you who are watching us online, uh, please make sure I encourage you to give as well, especially those who watch us consistently. Please make sure you sow into the infrastructure of this ministry because we are touching lives credibly and legitimately. All right. So, Father, we thank you for this time for us to give yet again unto your work. We thank you that the finances that we give shall translate into souls being saved, men being touched, women being touched, families being brought together, people being delivered from demonic oppression, people who are encouraged, people taken off of depression and suicide, ideologies and vexations of spirit. We thank you, Father, that we are living up to our name here at Hope Christian Church to give hope, to minister to people, to give and breathe life, and to deal with many issues that are a lot of people don't want to deal with. But I thank you, Father, you've empowered us and you've anointed us to do so. Not only are we a house that we can refer people to other places, but we are a house that deals with stuff ourselves. We are a house that gets our hands dirty in the gospel to minister to people's lives. And I thank you, Father, that we are a light in a dark place in Beltsville, in this area, in Laurel, connected to all different areas up and down this corridor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. At this time, you are free to come up and give into the baskets. You are free to come up and give for those who are going to do so. Right now would be a good time to do it. And if I can get you to play something just gently real quick, please. And I say gently so people don't say, hey, he's trying to fire them up to give. Nah, we're not doing that. We don't do manipulation tactics here. We just give the word of the Lord and have people flow and do likewise. All right, check out the white boots. All right, sorry. Sorry, let me, let me get my personality back in the box. Because I know some of you are saying, this is the women's conference. What he's doing up there? Hey, I just, I just serve here, all right? I just picked up the call and responded. But I noticed the white boots. Anyway, all right. Praise God for that. All right, so I have the, the pleasure of introducing the minister this evening. Apostle Michelle Jackson currently serves as a senior pastor of Hope Christian Church. Yeah, bless her real good. Bless her real good. Mom, make her feel that love. Make her feel it. Appreciate her. Thank her for standing and forgiving. And all the things that she does, seen and unseen. Yeah. This is not blowing anybody's head up. This is supporting her. Because we are here right now because of the anointing that's on that woman. She grabbed the baton from Bishop Harry Jackson, and she's running with it hard and strong. Yeah. She was ordained as a pastor January 19th by Bishop Harry Jackson, and she served as a member of the Board of Trustees, a core team pastor, led women's ministry, and the marketing and strategy department of Hope Christian Church until Bishop Jackson passed away on November 9th, 2020. Her diverse work experience includes strategy development, corporate transformation, brand management, individual and executive team leadership development, and coaching programs. She has an earned bachelor's degree in, in uh, English literature from Williams College and currently is studying and pursuing a master's of arts in Christian ministry from the acclaimed, the highly acclaimed Old Roberts University. Let's bless her again one more time. All right, give God some praise tonight. Awesome. Well, you can have your seats. I'm privileged to bring the word tonight, and I'm really excited because I want to talk to you from the theme of when the past is present. When the past is present. 
Spirit of the living God, we thank you that we've already begun to experience a fresh touch from you in the worship service. And Father, we thank you that you've brought us all here to hear what you have to share with us and how we can walk in victory. So Lord, we ask that you would speak even as I'm speaking, that people would be touched and even those who watch the replay would receive impartation from the Holy Spirit and all of the people of God say? Amen. So, you know, I was praying about the conference and the Lord began to minister to me about how he wanted his daughters to walk in victory. And he gave me the scripture, which is the theme of the conference, right? Psalm 144, verses 1 and 2. And he began to talk to me about how he wants to train us, but how he wants us to be open to receive from him. And as I was praying about what I was going to share and what he wanted me to share, I really felt like the theme that we needed to touch on tonight in the opening portion of the conference was addressing when the past is present. We all go through things. We all go through challenges. And we're going to go straight to Genesis chapter 31. I want to tell you a little bit about Jacob and Rachel. I want to tell you a little bit about their love story. And I want to contextualize where Rachel was when transition came to her. Because oftentimes when we're transitioning, we don't recognize how much the past is informing what we're looking at in the, in the present. We don't often understand that sometimes our soul area, um, our mind, our will, our emotions is actually coloring what we're looking at in the present. And that God wants us to be able to open ourselves up to what he has to say. And so... Jacob and Rachel, they had a, a, a one of the, what is it, star-crossed lovers, like, what is it, love at first sight. They saw each other. They were enamored with each other. They fell in love, and they decided that they were going to get married. But what happened on the wedding night? Lord, Jacob got wasted. White girl wasted. And then who was in his bed? The sister, <laughs> Leah, right? And so then he worked for seven years to earn the love of the woman that he originally desired to marry. Do you think about Rachel? Like, how would you have felt in those circumstances? Would you have felt rejected? Would you have felt betrayed by your father? Would you have felt like cheapened? Where would your value have been? So when we fast forward the story to Genesis chapter 31, these two sisters have been in a rivalry over one man. <laughs> Not just Jacob, but also their father. And they've borne children and they've strived to be significant in comparison to one another. And they have born children. They've tried to be the wife, the, the, the mother. They've tried to live up to the expectations of society. They've tried to live up to the expectations of even their own clan. Because how many know that we all have family expectations? And so sometimes we're living up to not our dream for us, but mom and daddy dream for us. And sometimes we're putting that on our kids. So Rachel and Leah, they have a wonderful opportunity that's about to be unfolded to them because it was the plan of God from the beginning to bring Abraham out of his father's house, right? And now generationally, Leah and Rachel have an opportunity to be a part of this third generation, 12 tribes that are going to become a nation. And they're the mothers that are actually fulfilling, living out the prophecy that was over Sarah's life. But in this moment of bearing children, of living daily life, they don't understand the significance 
of what God's doing. Well, don't you think that's true about us? That sometimes in the here and now, we don't always see how God's working and how he's weaving the story across generations to fulfill his promises, even to the women that lived for him before us. But in his faithfulness, he's calling Rachel and Leah into position to fulfill the word that he had spoken to Sarah. You're going to be a mother of many nations. Well, she only had one child. And so we're, we're going to look at the scripture because I believe that Rachel is like us. She didn't know how to handle how to leave, how to transition how to move forward, and how to allow the past to be in the past. So if you have your Bible and you're in Genesis 31, we're going to look at a few verses together. Turn to uh, verse 22. So the backstory is that the Lord speaks to Jacob and is like, it's time for you to return to the land. And that's significant because he had to run because he received his inheritance through manipulation, which we're going to get into. But I just want to give just a refresh on the story (laughs) because there's so many twists and turns. It's like as the world turns when you read Genesis, right? It's like you need, the, you need the scenes from the last so that you know where we're at in the story. Okay, Genesis 31, verse 22. Three days later, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he gathered a group of his relatives and set out in hot pursuit. He caught up with Jacob seven days later in the hill country of Gilead. But the previous night, God had appeared to Laban the Aramean in a dream and told him, I am warning you, leave Jacob alone. Laban caught up with Jacob as he was camped in the hill country of Gilead, and he set up his camp not far from Jacob's. What do, what do you mean by deceiving me like this, Laban demanded. How dare you drag my daughters away like prisoners of war? Why did you slip away secretly? Why did you deceive me? Why didn't you say you wanted to leave? I would have given you a farewell feast with singing and music accompanied by tambourines and harps. Why didn't you let me kiss my daughters and grandchildren and tell them goodbye? You've acted very foolishly. I could destroy you. But the God of your father appeared to me last night and warned me, leave Jacob alone. You can understand, I can understand your feeling that you must go on and your intense longing for your father's home. But why have you stolen my gods? I rushed away because I was afraid, Jacob answered. I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. But as for your gods, see if you can find them. And let the person who has taken them die. And if you find anything else that belongs to you, identify it before all these relatives of ours, and I will give it back. But Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the household idols. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. So, I want to explain something to you guys about the household idols. In antiquity, they were actually carvings of the family members who had gone before them. And sometimes they were used in divination, but typically they represented the people in your family. So... Rachel decided to take her family with her. She didn't, she didn't, she hadn't lived anywhere except where she had lived to this point. And now she's going to the promised land. She's going to Canaan. She's going with Jacob to the land that was promised to his family. But she's leaving everything she knows 
to move forward. Have you ever been in a situation where you are leaving everything or so it feels that this decision that I'm stepping into, I'm stepping into the unknown and I'm leaving everything I've known to enter into the new, what would you take with you? See, that's, that was the decision that Rachel had to make, and she decided to take the household gods. Now, see, you have to understand that because of Laban's manipulation, he had squandered their inheritance, and so they had no finances. So if you were really wealthy, then the carvings of your ancestors wouldn't be made out of wood. They'd be made out of precious metal or gold or something else that would be a value if melted down and sold. So this could have also been an act of defiance. We don't really know, right? Histor historians and theologians and Jewish scholars, they have all their perspectives. So I'm just sharing one tonight, right? But what about it? If you felt like you had no value and you were sold into a relationship, manipulated into a marriage, treated like a second-class citizen, would you be resentful? Would you steal in order to secure your future financially? Just a little off the top, right? I don't know. So Rachel, she, she made sure that she took something of value when she left. And in the same way, these could have been objects for divination. So unlike Abraham, who left his father's house, <laughs> she was leaving her house with something that could um, represent some tangible, some tangible expression of her household wealth. As you know, in antiquity, women weren't going to receive an inheritance. Inheritance went to men. So she wouldn't inherit property. It would have to be a male heir after her brothers had passed away. So unless she had been given something legitimately, she would not have anything unless her husband favored her and gave her something, but she was the second wife based upon her father's decisions. And so I think that when she was leaving, she felt like, what can I take? What can I claim that can be mine? How will I know who I am if I'm not connected to this place or this story? This is all I've known. And so I think that, you know, when I, when I started out, I was talking about when the past is present. I think we all have times in our lives where we recognize that we've been defined by the circumstances we're in, by the relationships we have, and we ask ourselves, who would I be if I weren't connected to these relationships? Or if I weren't connected to this place, who would I be? And the Lord was inviting Rachel to be a part of the lineage of deliverers for a covenant people. And it hadn't unfolded yet for her. It had, all the pieces hadn't come together. And so she wanted to take something with her of her past. Many of us do this, but we do this through not tangible remnants of the past, but we do it through vows. I will never be like my mother. I will never be like my father. I will never, I will always make sure that my kids have, we make vows about our future. I will always protect my children. I'll make sure that my children don't have to go through what I went through. And we take on these broad places that oftentimes put us in a position where we can't fulfill those things, right? And so I want to invite you to know that even as the Lord was using Jacob as a figure of Christ for Rachel, come on, how many know that the father ordained marriage? And so every husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. 
So Jacob is loving Rachel, and he's a figure of Christ in this story. And as the story continues, and they go to the place that God's calling them to, to encounter him, Rachel reaches a point of decision. And so I believe that's where we are as a people. What vows, what judgments have you said? I will always take care of myself. Always and never are curse words, is what my dad used to say. And they're also fighting words. Come on, if you're married in this room, you already know what I'm talking about. You always and you never is a recipe for an argument. But they're also curse words because they bind us into a way of thinking and a way of living and a way of being that sometimes is impossible. So take a moment and think about it. Because sometimes the pain we're protecting is the very pain that's holding us where we are. And so it's not so much about idolatry, although it is, right, for Rachel. And it's not so much about idolatry for us. We know that we should not have any gods before Jesus, but it's also about those things that we hold on to, that we cherish, that define us, that also become that impediment. So what do we do when the past is present? What do we do when we don't know how to move forward? What do we do? I believe we have to do what Rachel began to do as she followed her husband from the place of the known into the unknown. She was willing to give him what she had as they got to Bethel and to sacrifice those things and to let them go and to prepare herself for what was next. What would it mean this weekend for you to let some things go? What would it mean this weekend if the past were no longer coloring your present but was behind you? What would that mean? Who would you be? And I believe that the Lord wants us to know that in that place is freedom, but also in that place is who we've been called to be, who he saw before one day began when he wrote the story in the book and he ordained our days. So, we talked about resentment, we talked about anger, but what about just being offended? You know, I don't know about you, but if I were in Rachel's circumstances, I would just be outraged (laughs) and offended. I might feel like the options were very much few, that I might have been backed into a corner based on my choices. Because let's be honest, once her sister got married, she wasn't really obligated to marry him. Because customarily, the oldest needed to be married first, and then the second could be married. Some, Some families still work that way, where there's a pecking order in who gets married. And if you're next and you're not married and then you're over 30, it becomes a problem. Come on, I know some first-generation people know what I'm talking about. So she wasn't obligated, but I would submit to you, in my Holy Ghost imagination, the level of dysfunction that she grew up around wouldn't allow her to think that she could marry anybody else, that this was the best that was going to happen. And so in Lee, and now I'm married, and now I'm dealing with this confusion with my sister and raising my children, and oh my goodness, all this stuff, right? And now I realize, I come to the point of transition, and I realize, well, now 
my father hasn't left me anything. What else is there except to transition? Have you ever felt like the sum of total of your choices put you at the end of your rope? And then you were standing there like, this is it? This is everything I fought for. This is everything I cried for. This is everything I sacrificed for. This is it. But in this road of transition from her hometown to Bethel, God had an invitation and appointment for her. And it was in that journey that she would become to know who she was, but also she became the mother of Joseph. And Joseph was the one who, what, saved everyone. So there's redemption in your story. There is redemption in your story. And as you're walking down this path of transition, God wants you to know that whatever you've brought on the journey, he can handle it if you're willing to give that to him. So even in the verses that we read, those those household idols were maybe all that Laban had left of the wealth out of the cattle. See, they had to have land and, and whoever actually had the well owned the land in antiquity. So if there was no water, there was no land rights. And then you couldn't have cattle or any kind of crops. And so that's how you actually acquired wealth. And then once you had precious metals or things like that, that meant that you had enough finances to do something like that. Isn't that totally different from how we live today? We want to get the gold watch. We want to get the flashy shoes. We want to have all the trappings that look like money before we have money. But in antiquity, it wasn't even possible to do that unless you actually had worked the land, had acquired the flock, and then you would make an investment like that, right? So even in this moment, we're seeing Laban had manipulated, had um, treated his daughters poorly according to our standards, and then he was now losing his monetary investment. And it was actually causing division in the family. Have you ever had money problems hit the family? Over decisions that cause strife in the generations. Come on, everything that we go through is in the Bible. And so... We're seeing Laban and Jacob, they have to strike a deal. They have to make peace. And the peace is that there's going to be a division, that they're going to live separately. Sometimes we don't want that to be the way that peace comes. We don't want there to have to be a break. We're talking about the past being present. So we would rather live with everybody in the confusion than move into the place that God's calling us. So Jacob, he had to decide for his family, and then he had to get agreement from his wife. Right now, there are many of us that are going to be at this conference where our deliverance will come if we'll come into agreement with our spouse. Oh, I know, I can't get no help. (laughs) But he had to get in, they had to get into agreement as a family to move to where God was showing him, was leading him, and it was going to require something different in the family. They weren't all going to be able to be there together in the what had been comfortable for them. What was an environment, a way of handling things, a way of relating, a way of connecting, of talking to one another, about treating one another. It wasn't gonna be able to be how it had been. 
And guess what? At the beginning of Genesis 31, Laban had already begun to shift his attitude towards Jacob. So Jacob already knew that the time was right now to make a clean break. So I don't know about you, but sometimes when people make decisions, I'm talking to the wives in the room, when people in authority make decisions for me, I don't know, are you cool with it every single time, 100% of the time? But these women decided, despite our conflict, despite the challenges we have, if God told you to return to the land of your father, let's go. Look at Genesis 31 verse 4. Because this is important. Because some of us are going to come into agreement with our spouses and it's going to break some of the challenges that we've been going through. So Jacob called Rachel and Leah out of the field where he was working, out to the field where he was working. He said to them, I have noticed that your father's attitude toward me has changed, but the God of my father has been with me. You know how hard I've worked for your father, but he's cheated me, changed my wages 10 times, but God has not allowed him to do any, do me any harm. So skip down. To 11, he says, then in a dream, the angel of God said to me, Jacob, and I replied, yes, I am here. The angel said, look up and you will see on, that only the spotted, uh, sorry, the streaked, speckled and spotted males are mating with the females of your flock. For I have seen how Laban has treated you. I am the God who appeared to you at Bethel, the place where you anointed the pillar of stone and made your vow to me. Now get ready and leave this country and return to the land of your birth. Rachel and Leah responded, that's fine with us. We won't inherit any of our father's wealth anyway. He reduced our rights to those of foreign women. And after he sold us, he wasted the money you paid him for us. All of the wealth God has given you from our father legally belongs to us and our children. So go ahead and do whatever God has told you to do. So what is it saying here? God began to give Jacob a way out, a way of escape. And what happened is that his wives had to then come into what? Agreement with what God was showing was the pathway for deliverance for their family. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that there's no temptation such that is common to man, but that God is faithful and he will not allow us to be tested beyond what we can handle. And when we're being tested, he will what? Provide a way of escape. So in the context of a family, God is looking for men to lead. And he's looking for women who will come into agreement with their spouses so that the conditions of their life can shift, but also so the family can go higher. So this is not culture. This is not what happens in the culture. Right now, many of us are steeped in hearing for someone else or being the person who pursues someone else. But God has a way of handling things in the family. And he began to speak to Jacob in order to bring them out from where they were into the purposes of God. And Jacob, he'd had an encounter with God. And so because he'd had an encounter with God, God had something that he could call a return upon. Come on, I'm prophesying to you right now. Many of us have to begin to believe that in our spouses, in the men that we love, in our sons, that there's been an encounter and that there's something, there's a deposit of God that he can call a return upon. 
And so what happened is that her deliverance came as her husband began to respond to God. So God is looking across the earth right now. He's looking for those whose hearts are turned towards him. He's looking for whom he can favor. He's looking for those who be willing to step out of where they've been into where he wants to take them. And so Bethel was an important place. If you look at the whole arc of Jacob's story, you'll notice that that's where he encountered God the first time. But then that's where he encountered him again and took his relationship to the next level. If God can do anything but fail, don't you think he knows how to handle our past? Don't you think he knows how to handle our brokenness? Don't you think he knows how to handle those things that we don't even understand? And so I just want to invite you this weekend, this conference, this time to allow God to begin to speak to your heart, to begin to challenge you to run with him, to open yourself up to being abandoned to the things of God for your life. It might look different leaving where you've been to go where he's taking you. It might mean that there's some distance in your family. Actually, you'll notice if you read on, and I would recommend you read the whole, the whole thing. Time won't permit us to do it tonight and to get into all the details. But Jacob and his father-in-law actually had to come to a legal agreement about the distance. And they said, okay, let the Lord watch between us as we're in this distance so that they could, he and his family could pursue God's purpose and so that he could move on with his life without offense. I was talking about that before, how with Rachel, I probably would have been deeply offended which offense always leads to bitterness. Hebrews tells us that when we get offended, it opens us up to defiling others, right? And so we have to be aware of those things that easily beset us so that we can walk in the freedom that that God has. But some of the things that we are going to allow God to do this weekend is going to require a transition, Someone say transition. Transition means going from one state or being to another set of being or way of being. Do you know that there's a between? From one place to the next, there's, there's something that happens in that. And I believe that many of you came to the conference even tonight and will be here tomorrow that are living in that tension right now, right? We started, but we're not there yet. And how do I live in that tension? And I believe the Lord is going to help you to know how to continue to walk with him, to allow him to guide you and lead you, and to show you, even as he showed Jacob and Rachel, how to move forward into the place that God wanted to take them. So the voice of illegitimacy, let's talk about that. We all have an inheritance in the saints. Ephesians 1.18 tells us in Paul's prayer to the church at Ephesus, he says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance, and where? The saints. Colossians 1.12 says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance... Of the saints in the light. 
Ephesians 1.11 says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Making sure you're still awake. Inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Hebrews 3, 1 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. So I want you to see that part of what Rachel was after was what? Legitimacy and inheritance. And what her father did to her and her sister caused them to question their inheritance, their positioning, and also their legitimacy. Can I let you in on a secret? Satan is waging that same warfare against you and I all the time. He causes us to question if we're legitimately heirs of salvation. He, calls, he comes against us with accusation. He comes against us to find out if we truly believe what the Father said by the same tactics he used on Adam and Eve. Well, did the Lord really say? And so what we have to determine in ourselves is that I have an inheritance in God. And I don't have to take anything from my father's house because I have a father in heaven. I have an inheritance where what moth cannot destroy, nor thieves can break in and steal. So in, um, in Genesis, let's go back. I believe it's 35. I'm going to get it wrong because sometimes you leave the verse off. Yes, go to chapter 35, verse 2. So I've kind of been telling you the story. I've kind of been pacing with, trying to keep, keep pace with you so you can kind of get some of the highlights of what, God was, of what God was doing in their lives. And so we talked about the fact that the idols that she took, the household gods, could have been they're actually her family, that she didn't want to be separated from her family, so they represented her family. But if they were in fact idols and she was using them for divination, divination is actually the practice of seeking knowledge of the future or the, or the unknown by supernatural means. So divination might look like reading your horoscope. Divination may look like tea leaves. Divination may look like reading the coffee grinds. Come on. Divination may look like having your palm read. Divination may look like, let me read your cards, girl, and tell you what's happening in your life. So, so divination may not look like carrying some carvings on a camel in 2023, just saying. <laughs> but either way, <laughs> Jacob, who represents Jesus in Rachel's life, tells her in Genesis chapter 35, verse 2. So Jacob told everyone in his household what? Get rid of all your pagan idols. Purify yourselves and put on clean clothing. We are now going to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God who, answers my, who answered my prayers when I was in distress. He has been with me wherever I have gone. So verse 4, what happened? So they gave Jacob all their pagan idols and earrings, and he buried them under the great tree near Shechem. And they set, and they set out. As they set out, a terror from God spread over the people in all the towns of that area, so no one attacked Jacob's family. So what we can understand from the verse is that actually Jacob's family was believing that the pagan idols were what? Protecting them. They were providing some comfort to them. They were providing something to them that 
they had not yet learned to put their trust in God. But at the point of sacrifice or giving over those things to God as preparation, what happened? The fear of the Lord fell upon those who were surrounding them and no attack could prosper against them. So, so, so what I want you to understand is that some of the strategies that God is going to release to you in this conference are going to be things that you wouldn't think that matter, but they're going to be a symbol and a sign in the spirit and the adversaries that would come against you won't be able to come against you because you'll be under the protective covering of God. I, I was, I did something very stupid um, Sunday, got home from church, got home from church late, went out to lunch after church. How many are the after lunch, after church lunch crew? Anybody? Okay. Yeah. So I got home from church and got home parked, went in the house. And the next day I came outside and my car to go to the gym and my car was completely unlocked. I got home at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I didn't leave my house till 9 a.m. the next day. My car sat unlocked. My garage door opener was in my car. All my documents were in my car. Do you know that when I opened the door of my car, that even my trash was still there? Nothing happened because God covers us. That's my point. So sometimes we're not willing to trust God even when we know we need to. See, I didn't know I needed to trust God on Sunday afternoon. I just went home and was like, okay, we're done for the day. Thought I locked my car, hadn't locked my car. But in this moment, Jacob and his family needed to know in transition that they had the protective covering of God. And he set out to let their enemies know and all that were surrounding that he was what? With them. So do you need to know and do people around you need to know that God is with you? I would say in 2023, we need to know. And people need to know that you walk with God. And so he wants to release that to you. And that's why he wants to give us keys for victory. Keys, right? So we've had all kind of things happening on our ring cameras and all kind of messages going around. And when I walked to my car, I said, okay, here we go. Let's see what happened. <laughs> and nothing happened. Nothing was missing. So that is what happened for Jacob and his family. They continued to transition and they went to where God had told them to be without any hindrances because they were willing to surrender those things that were precious, those things that they had put their confidence in other than in the name of the Lord. And then he released his provision, his protection, and his presence over them. And the Bible says in verse 5, then they set out and the terror of God fell on all the towns around them so that no one pursued them. Meaning they were so covered and protected by God that no one even was tempted to take advantage of them. No one was even thinking about them. Isn't that powerful? So I just want to encourage you that sometimes we need to be willing to sacrifice those things that would hold us to the last season so that we can receive the protection of God. That whatever he would ask us to give or to sow in this type of environment, whether it be something, um, something personal or something that doesn't even have a like a, it's not a thing, it's more of a emotion or um, an inward thing, that whatever God asks us to sacrifice actually never um, leaves our life in the way we think. We don't lose. We don't lose. 
it actually becomes a sacrifice that he can consume and then release his favor. So that's what happened with that family. So I want to pray with you tonight about some, some words, some vows, some judgments, some things that would cause us not to trust the Lord in his leading in this season. And I just feel like there are many of us tonight that are looking towards the future and we have great hope and expectation, but we're expecting God to give some clarity, to begin to speak into some things. And I believe that he's going to do that this weekend. So can we just stand And let's just bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this story of Rachel. We thank you that you selected her to be the mother of Joseph. We thank you that you had purpose and destiny for her, regardless of the family she came out of, regardless of what her father, who her father had been to her the things that she had suffered, and even the things that she had come into agreement with that had impacted and influenced her path. God, you had provision already for her. So tonight, Lord, we just reflect upon your goodness right now. And we hear you calling us forward. We hear you calling us into the next season. Spirit of the living God, we thank you that even us, you have a plan for us. And it doesn't matter where we've been or the things that we have suffered, you have a plan for us. So Lord, we thank you tonight that even in the areas where the past has caused us to see our present circumstances, with challenge or even despair. God, I thank you tonight that you're removing those hindrances and barriers by your spirit. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I just ask that you would bless each daughter here tonight, Lord. Lord, that even as you're calling them to yourself, God, I thank you that the attachments and even judgments that we've had about the past, God, you're forgiving us tonight because of what you sacrificed on Calvary, God. We thank you that your forgiveness is available to us and that we can now move in forgiveness with ourselves, that we can release ourselves from the owl nevers and the owl always so that we can run fully in what you called us to be in and do in this season. And I thank you, Lord, that there's no issue too big and there's no issue too small, that there's nothing that would hold us or pluck us from your hand. No pain in the world, no issue great or small, can keep us from the love of God. So, Lord, we thank you right now that your love is beginning to flood this place. We thank you, Lord, that you're releasing your love upon each of your daughters, that they would know in this season that you've called them to yourself. Thank you, Lord, that you don't view us based on our past, but you view us based on who you called us to be through the blood of your son, Jesus. So, Lord, I thank you tonight that you're beginning that process of perfecting those things that pertain to us. Come on, you just begin to release whatever that hurt may have been, that specific hurt. Come on, you just begin to release those specific situations, those specific people, circumstances. You just begin to release them to the Lord right where you are in your seat. Thank you, Jesus, that as we specifically release hurts and pains 
and the things that have caused us to misjudge you. And even those things that have caused us to shrink back from the open doors that you've set before us, how we viewed ourselves. God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that we will encounter you and your love as we release, as we lay those things down tonight. Lord, I thank you that we don't have to be moved by emotion, but that we can move in faith because you respond to our faith and you release the answers to prayers. So God, I thank you that you are the God who answers by fire and that you are faithful. You're faithful to deliver. You're faithful to perform upon your word. And God, I thank you tonight that your love is beginning a work. Even as a key goes into a lock and begins to turn. God, I thank you that you're beginning to turn our perspectives, hardened places in our hearts and our mindsets. Things that we thought we could never let go of. Ways that we've tried to cause ourselves to feel legitimate. God, I thank you that by your love tonight, you're moving in. That we might know that we are fully connected to you. Come on, raise your hands right where you are. Thank you, Lord, for your love tonight. Come on, you just begin to thank God for his love for you, his care for you, that he's seen you right where you are, and that you can lay aside those things that you'd want to take forward that have no purpose in the future. God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the pathway forward. And we thank you, Lord, that you're teaching us how to transition well. You're teaching us how to be able to let go of those things that are in our hands to take your hand. We thank you, Abba Father. We thank you, Daddy God. We thank you. Come on, you just begin to thank him that you can release those things to him. Thank you, Lord, that as we release those things to you, God, your, your protection, your, the shadow of your wing is where we reside. God, we thank you for the protection of God against the pestilence, against the arrows of the enemy. God, we thank you that even as we give back to you the people that we felt have owed us, God, I thank you that there's a release of healing, there's a release of grace that's coming upon us. God, I thank you that because you have loved us with an everlasting love, you're pouring out your love tonight that we might know that it is okay to release and to let go. Thank you, God, that as we let go tonight, you're rescuing us from every trap that the enemy would set. And you're covering us. You're covering us with your love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your covering. Thank you that we don't have to be afraid of the terrors by night or the arrows that stalk in the daytime. Thank you, Lord, that you cover us because you love us so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father.
Thank you, Lord, that you will always be our God and that you've never left and that you've never forsaken us. Thank you for your love tonight. If you feel in your heart that you need to come to the altar just to take a step of faith to say, I'm moving forward tonight. I want to invite you to take that step. And I'm going to pray a covering prayer over you. Father, we thank you tonight that a bruised reed you will not break, nor a smoldering wilk will you snuff out. You've come to heal the brokenhearted and to bind up their wounds. So God, tonight, instead of self-protection, We ask that you give us a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone that knows how to trust you. God, we know that people will let us down again. We know that they have the capacity to break our hearts. But God, we thank you tonight that you are the source of our strength And that even in heartbreak and even in grief and even when we feel completely shattered, we can trust you. Come on, declare it. I will trust you. I will trust you at all times. Your praise shall continually be in my mouth. And even when I can't trace you, I will trust you. And tonight, I give you my heart. And I give you those inward things that I can't even always say. Help me. Show me your good plan for my life. I know you're a good father and I commit myself to you. Forgive me, cleanse me. Thank you that because of the blood of Jesus, I don't have to live ashamed, punished or afraid of what will happen next, but you're extending grace to me and tonight I confess and believe that your plan is the best plan for me you know me you love me and you know what will satisfy me and so I trust you come on you just begin to pour out your heart if you responded tonight Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. That tonight we can just put our hand in yours and venture into the unknown, knowing that you know the plans you have for us, hope and a future and an expected end. And God, we thank you for the lifting of hearts tonight to embrace the unknown with joy, expectancy, knowing that there's a hedge of protection all around. Glory to your name. 
Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Sekere boshana makala basonde ikaye. Oh, la basana make sheketi abasonta haye. Shikarabaso katana makoshkere isa la basonda. Father, we thank you that even as our sisters have taken this step of faith forward, oh, we just come behind them in intercession tonight and we plead the blood of Jesus and we come against every assignment of the enemy and we say, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. And God, we thank you that there's a weight of your glory that's coming upon them. I thank you that they're going to be marked by this conference and even this time tonight. And there's going to be a wind in their sails and even support against their back that they'll be able to stand even in the days ahead knowing that you are with them hallelujah to your name glory to your name oh you're an awesome God you're an awesome God mighty 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 great is your name Hallelujah. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. Nemeskere boshaka la basonte ikashka haye. Sotere beseke isatara baso kataya. Shonde ikaye se teko sana makoshe. And Lord, I just bless. I bless what you're doing. I bless tonight what you're doing with each one, God. I thank you, Lord. I just bless what you're doing with each one, Father. I bless what you're doing with your daughters. I bless what you're doing how you're releasing them into a new season and a new time, God. I thank you, Lord. I bless what you're doing, Daddy. I bless what you're doing, God. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for a fresh start and a fresh time. Oh, God, I thank you for the release of grace tonight. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for a new day and a new time. Oh, I thank you for the release of your grace upon your daughters. A new day and a new time. I thank you, Lord, for healing, for healing coming upon your daughters. I thank you. I thank you, God that the glory of the Lord shall be seen and revealed in each one. I thank you, Lord, that eyes haven't seen, nor ears heard, nor has it entered into their hearts, even those things that you have for them. And so, Lord, I thank you that in this anointing, in this time, God, you're going to begin to give them a glimpse of how much you have, how much you love them, how much you have yet in store, and how the best is yet to come. Oh, glory to your name. I thank you, Father. I thank you that the encouragement of the Holy Ghost is coming upon each one tonight. Tonight, I thank you, Lord, for hungry hearts that are searching after you, that are running after you. And I thank you for the release of your grace and the release of your anointing. Fresh anointing, fresh grace, fresh anointing, fresh grace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. 
Thank you for touching each one. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, King of Glory. Thank you, King of Glory. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God, we thank you for what you're doing. Oh, we bless her in Jesus' name. We bless her in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. He's an awesome God. We bless your daughter in the name of Jesus. Oh, blessing. Let the glory of God be revealed. So taraba shakataya, so tere so kana mashkara ba sataye lebo seke, i shara masataya ba shokara ba sataya. Bless your daughter, Father. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. I just see that. You're entering into a new season in your relationship with the Lord. And there's a weight of the grace and the love of God that's going to begin to flood your soul even tonight. And you're going to know the love of God. And that love is going to begin to apprehend you. And so, Lord, I bless your daughter. I release that love of the Father, that love, that love that causes us to cry out, Abba, Abba, Father, I thank you, God, for your love and impartation of the love of God tonight. Bless your daughter. Bless her. Thank you, Lord for your healing grace flowing upon her life. Thank you for the release of love, the release of grace upon your daughters. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your love, your love that finds us and your love that defines us as daughters of the most high God. We thank you, Lord, and we bless what you are doing. Hallelujah. So tarabashakata. Sekere Bosha, the love of God, the love of Abba Father, the love of God, the love of Abba Father. We thank you, Lord, for that impartation of love of the grace of God coming upon each one. We bless your daughter in Jesus' name. We bless what you are doing, Father. And we thank you, Lord, that you are touching her right now. Spirit of the living God, we thank you that you're falling afresh upon your servant. We thank you, Lord, for what you are doing in Jesus' name. We bless your daughter in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, even for that impartation of the love of God falling upon her now. God, we thank you that your banner over your daughter is love. And Lord, we thank you that she's defined by love in Jesus' name. Come on, you just begin to lift up. Lift up your thanksgiving and your praise to the Lord for his love, for his manifold grace upon your life. We love you, Father, and we thank you that we are known by you. So tarabasha ke te de mosakaye, 
Thank you, Jesus. So nama shekele bose teri boskahaye. Father, we thank you for what you were starting and what you've begun tonight in Jesus' name. Come on, and the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Such a sweet presence of the Holy Ghost in this place. And as my family members would say, it's only going to get gooder and gooder. So I want to invite you to be here tomorrow night and to bring a friend. Uh, my new friend, Pastor Kim Owens, will be preaching tonight, uh, tomorrow night, and she is a firebrand. She is a dynamic woman of God, and I know that the Lord has a word for you. I want to make sure I did not say what I was supposed to say, so give me a second here. I was supposed to say something. I want to make sure. Okay, cool. So, Father, we just seal this time in the name and the blood of Jesus. And, Lord, we thank you for what you're beginning, what you're starting in us. And we thank you that you're calling us out and into a new place. So, Lord, we thank you that this will be a holy adventure. And we have expectation and excitement of how you are going to release your word to us and how we will be equipped and trained to win. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, have a blessed night. Get home safe. And we'll see you tomorrow night in person and online. God bless you.